Today we're going to look at one of the central questions in philosophy of medicine. What is disease? What is it to have a disease? One way to start thinking about this question is just to consider the many things uh, that, that we would list as diseases. There are infections such as tuberculosis, listeria, Ebola. There are growth disorders, uh, tumours and cancers. Uh, there's physical damage that poses immediate risk of death like heart attack, collapsed lung, stroke. There are chronic illnesses that might not pose any problems in themselves but increase the risk of death such as uh, blood pressure, high blood pressure and high cholesterol. Uh, these might not even have any, any symptoms. Um, high blood pressure often is, is symptomless. There are long-term disabilities such as deafness, blindness, broken legs. There are mental illnesses. Perhaps there are also uh, diseases beyond the body. Uh, so mental illnesses seem to be connected with behaviours. They seem to be dependent on social context. Um, so perhaps they are not just straightforward bodily matters. So one question we might ask is, well, what is it that all of these different things have in common? Uh, what is it that makes them all diseases? Now, there are two basic approach to this, approaches to this. The first is uh, uh, naturalist or objectivist. On this view, whether or not somebody has a disease is a straightforward factual matter, and it's not dependent on value judgments. To say that somebody has a disease is just to say that they're in a certain biological state, uh, without any judgment about whether it's good or bad. Now obviously we can say that diseases are bad, but we don't have to. So consider something like death. It may be that we consider death a bad thing and we try to avoid it, but, but being dead is a simple factual matter. And to say that somebody's dead doesn't imply any judgment about their current state. Uh, so this is what the naturalist wants to say about disease. Disease is a very straightforward biological state, just like death is. The second approach is normativist or constructivist. On this view, the notions of disease and health are based on value judgments, on state that they're sort of states that we uh, value or disvalue. I won't say too much about this at the moment because there are a variety of ways of developing this approach, uh, but this approach denies that medicine can ever be a, a sort of purely empirical science like physics or chemistry. Health and disease involve value judgments. Maybe health and disease are even a relative to different societies, so that a condition that counts as healthy in one society may count as diseased in another. Um, but we'll uh, look at those in, in a bit. Now, by far the most famous naturalist account is Christopher Bourse's biostatistical theory of disease. So Bors wants to give a completely empirical, value-free account of disease. He wants to say that disease is a, sim is a purely biological state. Uh, now, first of all, Bors draws a distinction between illness and disease. I'll look at illness in a minute. Let's take disease first. According to Bors, a disease is a state of an organism which, first, interferes with the performance of some natural function, i.e. some species' typical contribution to survival and reproduction, characteristic of the organism's age, and second, is not simply in the nature of the species, i.e. is either atypical of the species, or if typical, mainly due to environmental causes. So, um, uh, those were some quotes from Bors. Now, the basic idea here is normal functioning with respect to survival and reproduction. Anything that prevents a body part functioning normally, uh, where this reduces one's chances of survival and reproduction, is a disease. And this is a simple statistical matter. If we want to know whether a certain body part is diseased, we just look at what that body part does in the general population. So how do hearts work for most people? How do kidneys work for most people? OK, well, kidneys work by removing waste from the blood. So if your kidneys aren't removing as much waste from the blood as average, then we can say that your kidneys are diseased. Um, of course, some diseases are uh, statistically normal, and this is the point of the second clause. Consider something like dental cavities. It may be that most people, at least above a certain age, have dental cavities. So technically, your teeth are functioning normally, even if you have these cavities. But we can say that this is a disease because it can be pinned on environmental causes. You have dental cavities because you've been eating a lot of sugary stuff, far more sugary stuff than would have been available in the conditions in which your teeth evolved. Um, but I think the, the sort of important uh, idea behind um, 
sort of Bors's theory is 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 really captured in in this first clause. Disease is something that uh, is it involves um, it, it's when a, an organ or a body part or a body process doesn't function normally. Um, and in order to determine normal function, you just look at at the rest of the population. Okay, is 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 your heart beating? Uh, is it pumping blood to the normal extent? Are your kidneys removing waste from the blood to the sort of average normal extent? Um, now, a couple of important points about this. First of all, uh, note that disease isn't simply a matter of abnormal functioning, but subnormal functioning. So the hearts of very he healthy people often beat abnormally slowly. Um, people who do a lot of exercise and eat very well will typically have resting heart rates below 60 beats per minute. Now, we wouldn't want to call these hearts diseased. Uh, indeed, they're working better than normal. The point is that the way that hearts contribute to survival and reproduction is by circulating the blood. And the reason um, these very healthy hearts beat more slowly is simply that they're more efficient at circulating blood than normal hearts are. So bear in mind that on Borsa's theory, uh, we identify how each body part contributes to survival and reproduction, and a body part is diseased only if it's performing less efficiently than normal. Uh, it's, not, it's not saying that anything outside the normal range is disease because some of the things outside the normal range are going to be more efficient than normal um, and that that would be perfectly healthy. Second point is that determining normal functioning requires a reference class. Suppose we were to ask what's the normal testosterone level for humans? Well if you look at all humans and make a statistical average you're going to end up with the wrong number because men on average have much higher testosterone than women on average. So if you were to then take both men and women and create a statistical average, uh, well, we'd end up having to conclude that the vast majority of people have either too much or too little testosterone. You know, most men would have uh, far more than average and most women would have far less than average. Uh, so clearly we need to relativise our judgments to sex. Similarly, if you ask what's the normal heart rate, well, heart rate changes as people age. A healthy heart rate for a newborn baby uh, would be pretty severe tachycardia for a 30 year old. So our judgments of normal function have to be relativized to age. The point is that when we judge what counts as normal functioning we have to ask normal functioning for which group of people. Now Bors suggests that, reference that the reference class should be given by age, sex and race. So if we have a 24 year old white man he will be healthy just in case all of the parts of his body and all of the processes going on in his body are functioning in ways that are statistically normal relative to 24 year old white males. Obviously that's going to be different to what's statistically normal for 75 year old Asian women or for three year old African girls. Okay now as we'll see in a minute there's, there are actually some big problems here but the basic idea is intuitive enough. Bors wants to say that health is statistically normal functioning where normality is determined relative to other members of one's age, sex and ethnic background. I think that's reasonably, it's, it's a reasonably simple idea, this, this theory. It's, it's fairly straightforward um, and it does help to explain certain facts about diseases. So consider the fact that colour blindness is a disease even though it rarely causes any problems whereas smell blindness to carbon dioxide isn't a disease even though it can be fatal. Um, why is that? Well, the answer for Bors is simply that smell blindness to carbon dioxide is typical of the species, whereas colour blindness isn't. Right, I said that Bors draws a distinction bef between disease and illness. We've seen disease, so what's illness? According to Bors, a disease becomes an illness only if it is 1. Undesirable for its bearer, 2. A title to special treatment, and three, a valid excuse for normally criticisable behaviour. Uh, as you can see, we're now invoking value judgments and practical social considerations. Uh, so so Bors's claim is that determining a disease is a simple uh, empirical matter. Um, it's just a, a matter of figuring out statistically normal functioning. Um, and then if somebody doesn't, uh, if somebody if somebody's body parts and processes aren't functioning normally, they're diseased. Whereas illness involves these kind of 
messier normative considerations, but we can have a purely empirical science of disease. There are many contexts where uh, we can say that somebody is diseased but not ill. A particularly controversial example is something like homosexuality. Homosexuality is statistically abnormal, and it also clearly interferes with reproduction, um, reproduction being an important function of the organism. Uh, homosexuality results in subnormality of function with regard to reproduction. So it looks like homosexuality is a disease, and Bourse just accepts this. He says that yes, homosexuality is a disease. Now he tries to soften this by saying, well, you know, don't worry, it's not an illness since we don't disvalue it. Okay, so Bourse's, Bourse's account of disease is supposed to be value free. Disease isn't necessarily a bad thing. So Bourse says that homosexuality is a disease because it's not, it's not under, because it's, uh, but because it's not undesirable, it's not something we try to treat. It's not an illness. Obviously, in the past, it would have been an illness because uh, in the illness it, it was regarded as extremely undesirable, and psychiatrists attempted to treat it. But these days, says Bourse, it's not an illness. Um, of course, I, I mean I'm not really sure that that's going to be of much comfort to homosexuals, and it surely plays right into the hands of homophobes who sort of want to push homosexuality out of society. I mean, Bourse is saying very clearly homosexuality does count as a disease on his view. Okay, let's consider some difficulties for Bourse. Um, first of all, I suppose an obvious one, uh, why, why draw this distinction between disease and illness? Is there maybe something dodgy going on here? Bors says he wants to give us a value-free empirical theory of disease, and he does. But then he has to introduce the concept of illness to sort of you know, plug up the gaps that are left in, in the theory. Uh, and once Bors introduces this concept of illness, doesn't the concept of his idea of disease become redundant? I mean, on Bors's view, illness is doing all the practical work. Illness is what actually matters. Illness is what we want to avoid. Illness is what doctors, psychiatrists, governments and so on are going to be concerned about and are going to spend money on. So why bother talking about disease? Well, I think there are a couple of uh, responses to this. First of all, medicine isn't just concerned with practical matters, but also with biological theory. Illness is what matters to us on the sort of day-to-day -day basis, but disease is the factual biological basis. Not everybody who's diseased is ill, but everybody who's ill must have a disease. Um, illness is a, a, an illness is essentially a disease that it has become incapacitating in some way. Uh, a second point is that it's actually quite standard to draw a distinction between disease and illness. Um, illness is sort of often considered to be a, a state of the whole person. So if you think about things like warts, mouth ulcers, ingrown toenails, well these are diseases but they generally don't make the victim ill. So it's not that Bors is uh, just drawing an ad hoc distinction to save his theory. The distinction between disease and illness is already made by plenty of people. Second, we saw that Bors uh, ties disease to survival and reproduction. But do all diseases lower the probability of survival? Well, consider something like chickenpox. If you get chickenpox once, you'll have a lifetime immunity to it. Now, for children, chickenpox is a mild infection, very rarely has any significant complications. For adults, it's much more severe, can be life-threatening. So it's generally seen as quite a good thing when children get chickenpox. If you have chickenpox as a child, this helps to prevent getting it worse in later years. So arguably, in the right context, chickenpox actually increases one's chance of survival and reproduction. But surely chickenpox is still a disease. A similar point related to this is that many diseases are chronic and can be kept under control. Consider HIV infection. A couple of decades ago, being infected with HIV meant having a drastic reduction in life expectancy. These days, HIV is no worse than diabetes. Uh, most people with HIV live relatively normal lives. With, with drugs, their immune systems can uh, be brought to something like normal functioning. And it's certainly conceivable that with further medical developments, with better drugs, a person with HIV could have basically normal life expectancy. Uh, the point is that it seems that somebody could have HIV, which 
would clearly be a disease, but uh, because they're taking the right drugs, um, the, the, the HIV wouldn't prevent a normal, immu normal immune function. Uh, and then it looks like Bors would have to say that actually HIV isn't a disease. On the other hand, maybe this isn't a problem. Um, I mean, after all, I suppose we do say things like, oh, well, people with HIV can live long, healthy lives. So maybe intuitions will differ on, on whether or not that's a problem. Um, third, Bors's theory is supposed to cover mental disease. Uh, indeed, one of the benefits of his theory is that it treats bodily disease and mental disease as equivalent. The problem is that it looks like it might be over-inclusive. We've already seen the example of homosexuality. But what about other uh, behaviours um, that lower the probability of survival and reproduction, such as extreme sports? Some sports, like mountaineering, can be extremely dangerous. Should we say that a person is mentally diseased if they're attracted to such activities? Perhaps the most serious problem for Bors was raised by... Um, uh, who knows, I have no idea how to pronounce that name, is that Elsie Line? I think that's Elsie Line Kingma. Uh, and uh, this is Bors's appeal to reference classes. As we saw, we can only specify what counts as normal functioning relative to a reference class, uh, given in terms of age, sex and race. But the question is, how exactly do we decide which reference classes to choose? Suppose that uh, Frank is an alcoholic and has damaged his liver. Well, that's clearly a disease. But if we take as our reference class other alcoholics, then Frank's liver condition may well be perfectly within the normal range. So the question is, why is it legitimate to use gender, age and race as determining the reference classes? But it's not legitimate to use uh, other traits like alcoholism. The basic worry here is that in choosing which reference classes to use, Bors is sort of smuggling in value judgments. We use age, sex and race as reference classes because those are considered to be uh, perfectly normal variations, perfectly, um, you know, OK, uh, normal variations to have. We don't use alcoholics as a reference class because because that's considered because alcoholism is considered to be undesirable. It's considered that it causes problems. But remember, Bors's account of disease is supposed to be purely empirical and value-free. That means we need to have an empirical, value-free justification for how we draw our reference classes. So one obvious response to this is, well, look, uh, age, gender, um, age, sex and race are a matter of your genetics. Um, well, I, I suppose age as a number isn't, but the rate at which which you age is a matter of your genes. The, the rate of your development is determined genetically. So these features are innate. On the other hand, something like alcoholism is clearly an acquired characteristic. It's based on behaviour. So one option would be to um, determine reference classes, uh, sort of tie reference classes to uh, genetic or innate differences. The main problem with this is that the distinction between innate and acquired traits, the distinction between traits that are written in the genes and traits that are influenced by the environment, is basically impossible to draw. All physiological traits and all behaviours are products of the interaction between genetics and environment. I mean, and indeed, things like alcoholism very clearly have a genetic influence. It tends to run in families. Uh, but anyway, even if you find some way of drawing the distinction between innate and acquired traits, uh, there are going to be plenty of diseases that are innate, like Down syndrome or Huntington's disease. Those are uncontroversially genetic. But we wouldn't want to use people with Down syndrome, for instance, as a reference class. Uh, otherwise, that wouldn't be a disease. Um, but it, it clearly is. A more plausible option is to point out that certain polymorphisms, uh, polymorphism is, is just variation within the species, uh, certain polymorphisms are maintained by natural selection, whereas others are selected against. We can distinguish legitimate from uh, illegitimate reference classes by determining which kinds of variation are selectively advantageous. Changes in the body over time, such as the, the, uh, the different heart rates at different ages, are maintained by selection. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's to your benefit that your heart rate is faster when you're an infant than it, and, and that it slows down as you get older.
Similarly, the physiological distinctions between men and women, such as the different levels of testosterone, uh, these are these are products of these these have been selectively produced and they are actively maintained in the population. On the other thing, on the other hand, things like uh, alcoholism, Down syndrome, Huntington's disease, heart defects, and so on, those are very clearly selected against. They're um, they make you less fit. So one possible problem with this option is that it will lead to many more reference classes than Bors suggests. There are all sorts of polymorphisms that are maintained by selection. For instance, in tribes that live at high altitudes, oxygen is much lower, and if a woman from, uh, for instance, Britain was to try to have a child at, at that sort of height, at a high altitude, the pregnancy would almost certainly fail. High altitude tribes have evolved specific adaptations that allow them to carry pregnancy to term in lower oxygen concentrations. Um, for a couple more familiar examples, just think about eye colour or blood type. Uh, those are maintained in, in the population. Um, so the trouble here is that we'll probably end up with hundreds or thousands of reference classes. Um, with Bors's suggestion of taking age, sex and race, it's very straightforward how to classify each individual. Once we're considering hundreds of, uh, hundreds of attributes, the taxonomy becomes a lot more cumbersome. But I mean, maybe this isn't, maybe that's not really a, a, a big a big problem. Um, you know, we'll just have to be a bit more careful about how we uh, determine sort of what group a person counts as part of. You know, what's, when we look at a person and we try to figure out whether or not they're diseased, we'll just have to consider um, more of their attributes than just their age, sex and race. I mean, may, maybe that's not a big deal. I think the most serious difficulty with, with this suggestion is that some traits are maintained by selection but are nevertheless considered diseases, such as sickle cell anemia. So there's uh, an allele of the haemoglobin beta gene which confers a resistance to malaria, but it also disrupts the production of haemoglobin, um, the protein that carries oxygen around in the blood. If somebody has only one copy of this allele, plus the standard allele, then they will have resistance to malaria, and they'll also produce enough normal haemoglobin. Somebody who has two copies of the allele um, will not produce enough he uh, normal he haemoglobin, and they'll develop sickle cell anemia. Uh, obviously, in most of the world, this allele is, uh, would be rapidly selected against. Um, but in places where malaria is endemic, it's of great advantage to be heterozygous for the malaria resistance allele. So it's a great advantage to have one copy of the malaria resistance allele and one copy of the normal allele. A consequence of this, just because of how genetic inheritance works, is that many people will be born with two copies and they'll have sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is a consequence of selection for the malaria resistance allele. Now obviously we don't want to say, uh, we don't want to take people who have at least one copy of the malaria resistance allele as our reference class because otherwise sickle cell anemia will turn out to be within the normal range of variation and then it won't be a disease. I mean the basic worry here um, with, with this suggestion, um, the basic worry with appealing to selection to distinguish reference classes is that selection often involves trade-offs. Selection can reduce fitness in one respect if this helps to improve fitness in other respects. So selection can explain both health and disease, which means selection can't give us a way to distinguish appropriate from inappropriate reference classes. So I mean, this is, is I think, probably the, the, the biggest problem for Bors. Bors needs to come up with some way of, um, he needs to come up with a clear way of demarcating the illegitimate reference classes uh, from the legitimate ones, but it's not entirely clear how to do that. Um, so that, I think, is, is a pretty serious difficulty. OK, well, let's turn now to some value-laden approaches. So remember that on these views, the concepts of disease and health necessarily involve value judgments. To say that something is diseased is to say that it's in some respect bad. Um, you know, it's bad for the, the thing that has the disease, uh, unlike Bors's theory, which is purely em empirical and value-free. The holistic theory of health was proposed by Lennart Nordenfeldt. Uh, this, th this theory is 
sort of in the middle in, in a way of naturalism and constructivism. On the one hand it is normative, it appeals to value judgments, but on the other it still yields objective answers about who's healthy and who's diseased. There's still a fact of the matter about what counts as diseased. Um, this theory is concerned not simply with survival but also with the quality of life. To say that somebody is healthy is to make a, uh, a sort of positive evaluation of their whole bodily and mental state. Now, according to Nordenfeldt, there are two basic perspectives for thinking about health and disease. First, the analytic perspective. This involves breaking down the organism into parts, studying the structure and function of different parts. Uh, think of questions like, how does the heart work? What is the capacity of the lung? What is muscle tissue composed of? This is a uh, mechanistic, reductionist perspective, uh, influenced by the hard sciences. Borse's biostatistical theory is an example of this perspective. The holistic perspective, on the other hand, considers the whole person and their uh, capacities and abilities that they use to get about on a day-to-day -day basis. Think about questions like, how well is this person? Or, what can this person do? Uh, can this person pursue normal social functions? On the holistic perspective, health and disease are concepts that apply to persons embedded in particular environments. Uh, now, of course, this isn't to deny that the empirical scientific questions are important. The idea is just that the concepts of health and disease are things that apply to whole persons. OK, so Nordenfeldt's holistic theory says, a person P is completely healthy if and only if P is in a bodily and mental state such that he has the ability to realise all his vital goals given his standard environment. Important part of this different definition is vital goal. A vital goal is the class of conditions that are such that the fulfilment of them is necessary for the person's long-term minimal happiness. So a vital goal isn't necessarily something um, that you intentionally strive for. You might be unaware of what makes you happy, as is clearly the case for, um, for babies, for people who are mentally retarded, for, for, for animals. Um, Nordenfeldt says that anything that's necessary for your long-term minimal happiness is, your vi is a vital goal, whether or not you're aware of it. Uh, and minimal happiness, uh, because you don't need to be joyously happy, vital goals are those that are necessary for just basic, standard, everyday happiness. So that's health. Disease is just the negative of this. You're diseased if you have at least one organ or, or, or body part or body process that tends to reduce your health. So that uh, one you know, part or process that tends to interfere with your ability to realise all your vital goals. Bear in mind, I say, tends to reduce your health, because a disease doesn't have to reduce your health. Some diseases resolve themselves before you even become aware of them. Infections, for instance, like mild colds, might not make themselves known. Uh, or things like hypertension, high blood pressure. Hypertension is often symptomless, and if somebody who has hypertension and is unaware of it changes their lifestyle, maybe they start getting into exercise, then it could be resolved without ever causing them any problems. Hypertension doesn't necessarily interfere with your vital goals. It's just that uh, it, it kind of increases the probability of problems. So it still counts as a disease. A benefit of this view is that it focuses on our subjective experience of health and disease. Uh, the intuition behind it is that health and disease aren't simply biological states. They're inextricably connected to aspects of your personal experience and also your culture. Um, exactly what's necessary for your basic happiness is going to depend a lot on your upbringing. So this theory makes some room for cultural variability of conditions. Obviously things like you know, cancer, heart attacks, stroke, Ebola and so on, they're going to count as diseases no matter what the context. But this theory does allow that health and disease have a, a social dimension. Um, one major objection to this view is that it's far too inclusive and leads to a massive expansion of diseases. To illustrate, consider the example of Lily the athlete, suggested by uh, Thomas Schramm. Lily struggles for her whole life to become an accomplished high jumper. For as long as she can remember, she's been committed to becoming one of the world's best high jumpers. Now, it may well be that one of Lily's vital goals is to succeed, 
Remember, a vital goal is a condition the fulfilment of which is necessary for minimal happiness. Success at high jumping may be necessary for Lily to be minimally happy. If she fails, she's going to be frustrated, depressed, despondent. So now, if Lily fails, uh, at least one of her vital goals will not be met, and so she'll be diseased according to this definition. But that just seems absurd. Now, Nordenfeld responds to this, that health and disease uh, shouldn't be seen as two separate boxes, but instead constitute a spectrum. There are different degrees of health and disease. Just because somebody's not completely 100% healthy doesn't mean we should consider them diseased. So Nordenfeld kind of bites the bullet here. He holds that, in, uh, that with Lily, Lily's health is reduced somewhat by her failure, failure to become a high jumper. But it's only reduced a small amount. It's not reduced enough to make her unhealthy, to make her diseased, uh, nor is it reduced enough to justify seeking health care. Um, as Nordenfeld points out, she can easily return to a state of full health by simply setting more realistic goals for herself. There's actually another possible response here uh, that Nordenfeld doesn't mention, but which I think is more plausible. Um, most people aren't like Lily. Most of us could live perfectly happy lives, even if we fail to achieve our highest goals. Lily should be disappointed, but she shouldn't think it's the end of the world. So given how Shram has described Lily, it sounds to me like she might have problems with depression. She's maybe not able to regulate her emotions in the appropriate ways. In which case, it's no problem that the holistic theory considers her diseased. She is diseased, and she should probably see a psychiatrist. Second problem is kind of the reverse of the first. Must all diseases interfere with your vital goals? Uh, so the, main, the, the, the point here is that minimal happiness is a very weak requirement. Uh, it doesn't take much to be minimally happy. Uh, so think about warts or mouth ulcers, or even something more serious like gum recession uh, and the following tooth loss. Would losing my teeth interfere with my minimal happiness? I'm not sure it would. Um, I mean, it would be a bit annoying, but I think I'd get over it. If my gums sort of all receded and I lost all my teeth, uh, that doesn't seem like it would be a huge big deal to me. I think I could still live a perfectly fine life and still be perfectly happy. Um, but, seri you know, but gum recession and tooth loss are clearly diseases. So the worry then is that, uh, you know, as I say, the converse of the first problem, the worry is that it's too exclusive. Many things that uh, are clearly diseases don't count as diseases on this view. Another problem is that this theory is difficult to apply to other species. Other species can be diseased. Animals, plants, bacteria, any living organism of any kind can have diseases. Now, Bors's biostatistical theory has no problem with this. For Bors, disease is just abnormal functioning that reduces the probability of survival and reproduction. But the holistic theory ties disease to the frustration of vital goals, where vital goals are connected to long-term minimal happiness. Obviously, many, many animals, um, presumably all plants, bacteria, fungi, archaea, so on, don't experience happiness. The basic response to this problem is to expand the theory. Um, Granted, not all living things experience happiness, but, says Nordenfeldt, all living things do have welfare, or well-being, or uh, interests in an extended sense. Nordenfeldt says, A living being is perceived as a unified system of organised activity, the constant tendency of which is to preserve its existence by protecting and promoting its well-being. A plant isn't made happier by having access to sunlight. But this does improve the, the well-being, the welfare of the plant. So what we can say is that a vital goal is a necessary condition of long-term welfare. A being is healthy if it's in a bodily state such that it has the ability to realise all its vital goals, where vital goals are conditions the fulfilment of which is necessary for long-term welfare. We can simply add that in humans and other sentient animals, an important component of welfare is minimal happiness. This allows us to extend the holistic theory to non-sentient beings, while still holding that for sentient beings, happiness is central to health. Now, I'm not sure that this response is very convincing. We're saying that a plant has welfare or well-being, but why should we consider? Why should we believe that a plant is better off being uh, well-nourished rather than undernourished? Why is it better off uh, having 
full strong leaves rather than being weak and wilted? Why is it better off being put in sunlight rather than being kept in the dark, being free of caterpillars rather than being eaten by caterpillars? Uh, my worry here is that the obvious answer to these questions is simply because this is what makes the plant healthy. A plant that's well-nourished is healthier than an undernourished one. A plant that's uh, um, robust is healthier than a wilted one. A plant's welfare or well-being is simply identical to its health. But obviously Nordenfeld can't say this, otherwise his definition of health becomes viciously circular. He'd be saying that a being is healthy if it's in a bodily state such that it has the ability to realise its vital goals, where vital goals are conditions the fulfilment of which is necessary for the being's health. And that's obviously unacceptable. So Nordenfeld needs to define well-being without appealing to health. Now, one possibility is survival and reproduction. A plant's welfare is increased if its ability to survive and reproduce is increased. But now we're just back to Bors's biostatistical theory. Nordenfeld explicitly wanted to avoid tying health to survival and reproduction. So I'm not entirely sure how he can proceed here. OK, well, uh, I think that's enough for today. Um, we will uh, look at a few more theories in the next video, but for now, that's all. Thanks very much. Thank you.